What have we been talking about the last few weeks? Perfect protection. Psalm 4 and 8 says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep without drugs. <laughs> huh? Prescription or otherwise. Don't need them. Hmm? You do realize we live in a medicated society. Hmm? People just accept it as normal that you take a pill for this and you take a pill for that and you take a pill for the other. You take a pill to relax. You take a pill not to be nervous. You take a pill to go to sleep. Then you need groggy, so you need a pill to kind of pep you up, right, and wake you up. Hmm? Mrs. Will, you're making fun of me. I didn't call your name. <laughs> I am telling you, you don't need all that. And, it, and it's hurting you more than you know. Hmm? The, these drugs are powerful. They affect you in numerous ways, especially when you start taking two and three and four and five and they start interfering with each other. There's a reason why there's all that print at the bottom of the label. <laughs> Have you ever read it? A lot of times they'll say it real fast on the commercial, like, you know, uh, you know, may cause this and that and may cause stupidity and loss of memory. And, <laughs> you know, and, some instances, loss of life, da 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 and the music is happy, and you go, what, what'd they say? This thing could kill me? <laughs> and people don't, huh? I mean, it, it is so common that people think, yeah, yeah, you know, give me some. <laughs> Gotta have my meds. You particularly want to watch about medication for psychological things. Oh, yes. Particularly want to watch this kind of thing. And somebody said, well, yeah, I got this and I've got this imbalance and I got that. You have a healer. Amen. You have a healer. Do not be content to live on that low level of life. When your God can fix you, he can fix your glands. He can, he can adjust your levels. Did you hear me now? He can heal you if you'll believe it. If you think it's too hard for him, then you'll just rely on these crutches. But no, you don't have to have something to put you to sleep. He gives his beloved sleep. And that sleep is sweet and peaceful. And when you're right with God, there's nothing to keep you awake anyway. Your conscience is clear. You're right between you and God, right between you and your family. And, and you didn't lie to anybody on the job that day. And you didn't steal anything that day. And, hmm? Didn't backstab anybody that day. Should be nothing keeping you awake. <clears throat> Let's keep moving right along. <laughs> the English version, today's English version says, when I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O oh Lord, keep me perfectly safe. One big reason I can lay down, peace, go to sleep, because I am not afraid of the, the terror by night or the arrow that flies in the day, or the pestilence, I'm not afraid. Why? Because you alone, Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Say it out loud. You alone, O oh Lord, you alone, Lord. Keep, me keep me perfectly, perfectly safe. safe. That's why I sleep so good. Isn't that what he's saying? Yes. Now go to Psalm 91, the great protection song 
A lot of you have known it for years. A lot of you could quote it or at least parts of it. Some people read it regularly, speak it over their self, and that's all good. But it's not just doing things by rote and routine that get results. It's not just what you know that gets results. This psalm describes things that we are to do. And us having done these things tells us what God is going to do. So just knowing the psalm are, are, you know, people say, well, I, I have a copy of this on a little a card and I keep it in my pocket. And that can mean nothing. Hmm? You got a lot of Christians that are just as superstitious as people that worship idols. Superstitious. Well, I've got my my good luck thing, and I've got my little medallion that keeps me safe. You say what? (laughs) Say what? (laughs) Then you're in trouble. (laughs) You're not supposed to have any images that you pray to or trust in at all. Hmm? It says nothing about any emblems or pictures or cards in this, in this psalm. It says, I trust in God. The God that you, you can't see. Let's read it. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now we've talked about this. What is this shadow of the Almighty? It is a canopy of protection. This is not just talking about just casting a shadow like light and there's light and there's shadow. No. What's under this is protected and kept by the power of God. He, he said, you know, I, I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks. And, and the Bible talks about the prophet used that same description like the eagle that covers her young. God can, can extend his arms. The Bible right here it talks about his, his wings and his feathers, but it has to do with his ability to put power over you, yes. to keep you. And if you dwell... In the secret place of the Most High, that's your part. You will abide, that means you live there. You stay there where? Under this protective canopy. You live under the protection of the Almighty. Now, if you were here last Friday, we got into some detail. Does does the Bible say anything about how to dwell in Him? We read in numerous places, one particularly in 1 John, if you keep his commandments, you dwell in him and he in you. You've got to listen to what he says. Do what he says. And you will live under this protective canopy. Keep reading. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord. Is this something we're to do? I will say of the Lord what? He is, is in italics, it's added by the translators. You could just start it like this. I will say of the Lord, my refuge, my my fortress, my God, in him or in you, will I trust. Are you supposed to say this? Hmm? You're supposed to say it with confidence. Particularly, you don't have to be, but especially if you feel shaken or challenged or something's trying to bring fear on you. Don't just shake silently. Hmm? Do you have a God? Does he have power to protect you? Is it his will to protect you? Yes, Yes, but do you have a responsibility in it? Well, among other things, what did he tell you to do? You are to say something. Hmm? 
Something's trying to shake you, mess with you. You should immediately open your mouth and say, God is my refuge. He's my fortress. What is that saying? He's my protector. That's what the refuge is. That's what the fortress is. The protection. He's my God. I'm trusting him to do what? Protect me. Now, friends, I, this wasn't my idea to teach on this subject. I, I don't, I've had people try, sometimes bring requests. Would, Brother Keith, would you teach on this? Would you teach on that? I don't teach on what I want to teach on. So I'm not going to teach on what you want me to. <laughs> so what, so say, what do you mean? I pray I seek God to see which way to go. Amen. Whether it's what I think or whether I don't, if, 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 if he get, directs me that way, that's the way to go. And I just know in my spirit, this is pertinent. It's timely. And we, all of us in this church, and I wish everybody that's here on Sunday would be here too. I hope they're not missing out. Now, if they're somewhere else, the Lord told them to be, well, they're okay. If not, then they're missing out. And, and the problem is, it, it, it happens in, in churches and ministries all over the country, all over the world. Things are going along pretty good, and people are carnal, and they're not very close to God, and they just come to church once in a while, maybe, and then a crisis hits, and they want to come and get somebody to counsel them and help them and give them in an hour session what they should have been getting two and three hours a week for the last six months, Amen. it doesn't work. Right. Now, God's merciful, but you just can't grow in a day what you should have been getting fed and growing for the last two years. Yes, Amen. People don't take church seriously enough. They, they just, you know, rock along. But if we we'll focus and be where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there, hearing what we're supposed to be hearing, remembering it, doing it, putting it into practice, then we will not be caught off guard. Amen. And anything comes up, you'll find it again and again. You'll go, that's why the Lord's been talking to us about that. We're ready. We're, we're ready. That's why the Lord put this in us. How many of you know the Lord is never behind the enemy? Never. Never. Hallelujah. And if people wind up being behind the enemy, it's because they weren't listening to their Lord. Right. He'll always have you ready, prepared ahead of time, right. built up, strong, ready for it, right. to overcome it. Yes. If you follow him. Yes. I wrote this down years ago in the leaf of my Bible. Uh, prepare every day. No, 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 excuse me. If you'll obey every day, you'll be ready always. Oh, yeah. praise God. Thank you. Just, just obey what the Lord's showing you to do. If he directs you, read this, read it. Pray this, pray that. Go to that service, go there. Listen to that series. J just obey every day, and you'll always be ready. No matter what happens, you'll be, obey every day, you'll be ready always. So... What am I saying? What is the Lord saying? Anything happens around you, it should just pop out of your mouth. God is my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my protector. God protects our family. I trust him. This is part of your and my responsibility. If we expect the results of this psalm, we've got to do our part. Say it out loud again. God's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my fortress. He, protects he protects us. I trust him. I trust him. Anything tries to mess with you, it just ought to come out of your mouth. It ought to be so strong in you, you don't even have to think about it. It just comes right out of your mouth. God's our protector. Oh, they say such and such. You say, God's our protector. He's our refuge. He's our fortress. We trust him. He will keep us. He'll protect us like always. You need to start saying it immediately. Well, if you're not full of that, something else will come out. Whatever you're full of, <laughs> it's what's going to come. It's true. You know? 
If all you feed on is soap operas, That's right. then soap opera stuff is going to come out. You're going to act like one of the stars yeah. in, in your soap opera. If all you're full of is, is gossip and talking problems, then that's what's going to come out. Oh, but if you're full of this, if you're full of this, then when you're squeezed, that's what's going to come out. Something squeezes you and you'll just go, God's my God. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He protects us. Keep reading. Surely, you talk like that, what happens? Verse 3. Surely he will deliver you from the snare, that's the trap, of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings shall you trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid. Is that our part? We cannot yield to fear. Just because you feel afraid doesn't mean you've yielded to fear. Just because thoughts of fear come to you, I don't care if the hair stand up on the back of your neck, your knees are bumping together, that's not the end of it. The devil says, ah, oh, it's too late, you're already scared, spitless. You're already scared, scared. You say, shut up, shut up. I refuse to fear. I refuse to be afraid. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, will. What's that? That's your will. It's got nothing to do with how you feel. I will. Fear no evil. I will to not be afraid. Don't, don't get confused about your feelings. Symptoms of fear. Yeah, there are times you'll feel shaken. Your thoughts of fear can grip you. Feelings can grip you. Fear is real. It can come on you and just try to grip you. And your heart pound and you and perspire and your blood pressure come up. But what do you do when that happens? Hmm? You say, oh, no, 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 I refuse to be afraid. I re- fear I resist you. I resist you. God's my God. He protects me. I will not be afraid of the terror by night. I'll not be afraid of the air that flies by day. I'll not be afraid of the pestilence uh, that walks in darkness. I'll not be afraid of destruction that wastes at noonday. Nothing in night, nothing in the daytime, nothing. Uh, hold your place right there. Go to Psalm 27. Why do we review like this? It's not enough just to get it in your head or say we covered the material. We've got to get it in our spirit so much that it becomes a part of us. Psalm 27, are you there? He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Man, he just sassy about it. (laughs) Who would I be? Well, if you know God and he's on your side, Who's bigger than him? Then who do you have to be afraid of? Because nobody's bigger than him. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He says it again. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, what? My heart shall not fear. Is this important? This is our part. We must not fear. Can you keep from being afraid? Millions of Christians don't believe it, but you can. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. If he said don't let, he didn't say try not to be afraid. That's men's reasoning. The Lord never told you to try anything. To tell you to try to do something means he might not know whether you could do it or not. He wouldn't have told you to do it unless he knew you could do it. 
Some of the modern translations will have try this, try to do this. It's not in the Bible. It's wrong. The Lord never told you to try to do anything. He didn't say try to love one another. He didn't say try to believe me. Try to have faith in God. No, no. He didn't say try not to be afraid. What did he say? Don't let your heart be troubled. Neither let it. Who's understood subject? You. You are not to allow your heart to be afraid. Then you can keep from it. Just because you feel it doesn't mean that's the end of it. You can feel all kind of stuff and you can still say, oh, no, 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 I don't care what I feel. I refuse to be afraid. Everybody said out loud, I refuse refuse to fear. fear. I refuse. I I will not not yield yield to fear. fear. God didn't give me me the spirit of fear. fear. I have have the the spirit of power. And love, and love and a sound mind. And a sound mind. I, have peace I have the peace of Jesus. Of Jesus. I, have I have the mind of Christ, of Christ. And, I not and I will not be afraid. Be afraid. Man, it helps you just to talk like that. Release your faith. Talk like when you feel afraid, talk like that, and your feelings will change. You do not have to be afraid of anything. Afraid of losing your marriage. Afraid of losing your business. Afraid of losing your kids. The Bible said your fears will come on you. Fear draws destruction. Don't do it. No matter what you feel, no matter what you see, what's he saying? Let me read this to you from another translation. Psalm 27 Today's English version says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will fear no one. Say that out loud. I will fear no one. He said, The Lord protects me from all danger. I will never be afraid. I'm reading the Bible. The Lord protects me from all danger. I will never be afraid. Say it out loud. The Lord protects me from all danger. I will never be afraid. Can you do that? Now, there there are all kind of Christians that will try to tell you, well, Brother Keith, everybody gets afraid sometime. The Lord commanded us not to. Take the head of the church's instruction seriously. He said, when evil men attack me and try to kill me, they stumble and fall. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Glory to God. Even if enemies attack me, I will still trust God. Can you see trusting God not being afraid. Go hand in hand. You can't be afraid and be trusting God. You can't yield to the fear. If you're trusting God, you're not yielding to the fear. If you're yielding to the fear, you're not trusting God. Hmm? Thank God we can live a fear-free life. Some have said, I I called on the Lord. He heard me, delivered me from all my fears. Go back to Psalm 91, please. He said, verse 7, Psalm 91, 7, a thousand will fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you've made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you. How much? Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Said out loud, evil Evil does not befall me. me. Plagues Plagues 
don't come to my house. <laughs> he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They'll bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against the stone. We talked about that. Do you have angels? Yes. Yeah. You have an angel and angels assigned to you. God has charged them to take care of you. This is not imaginary. This is not a fairy tale. This is real. The Bible said concerning little ones, it says their, T-H-E-I-R, their angel does always behold the face of my father. Well, why would you lose your angel just because you grew up? Hmm? You have angelic protection. It's very real. You need to believe it's there. You need to expect that if you need it, they will swoop in, pick you up, pick your car up, your house up, whatever you need, right? Catch you, steady you, prop you up, move you. Huh? Step in to defend you. Take up your side, your cause. Say that loud, I have angels. They camp round about me to deliver me. They protect me. They'll bear me up in their hands lest I hit my foot on a rock. Amen. Amen. Now go with me, if you would, over to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and let's look at where this passage is quoted in the New Testament and go further tonight. God is a God of protection, and we've been going into to area after area of how he protects, how he protects. And what we're seeing is our responsibilities and then what he said he will do when we do our part. We're to live in him. We're to obey him. Stay in fellowship with him. Stay in him. We are to say out loud and unashamed, he's my God. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. My God. And I trust him to keep me and protect me. We are to not allow fear of any kind and any degree. You got to stay on your vigilance on this because it's a subtle thing, isn't it? Watch out for feelings of dread, dreading this, dreading that, feelings of panic or fear of any kind. They are spiritual contraband to you. You must not be caught with any of it. Hmm? We see that God covers us. What's his part? He covers us with his protection. He's assigned and charged his angels concerning us. And one thing we begin to see, he has always protected his own with warnings. For knowledge forewarned and, and prepared. In Matthew 4, this is where Jesus, after being baptized and the anointing coming on him, was tempted out in the wilderness for 40 days and nights. And in one of these temptations, Psalm 91 was quoted by the devil. Does the devil quote scripture? <laughs> yeah. That's why you need to know the word. So if somebody's pulling out half a verse and trying to make it say something it doesn't say and misapply it, you know the other half. And you know the verse that comes before it and the one that comes after it. And the context, and you know the other scriptures. The Bible said, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
How do you rightly divide a scripture with other scriptures? Where are the answer to scripture questions? In the scriptures. Scriptures. Right? Don't look outside the Bible to find answers to Bible questions. Look in the Bible. And when the devil quoted scripture to Jesus, what did Jesus say? It is also written. Hmm? Need to know the word. That's why everybody at Faith Life Church reads their chapter every day, Monday through Friday, widely known throughout the Ozarks and far beyond now. Right? Read your chapter. That's the minimum. That's the minimum. The Bible said in uh, Matthew 4 and 8, excuse me, uh, 5, Matthew 4 and 5, the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple. This was probably the highest uh, point of any building in the whole area. It'd be like taking you up to the top of the tallest skyscraper, and said to him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. In other words, jump off of here. For it is written, he's going to give him a scripture why he should do it. (laughs) Now we're, we're laughing And it sounds humorous, and from our perspective, knowing Jesus' response and knowing the end of the story, we're not even seriously considering jumping off. One thing we need to remember, Jesus was tempted to do this. If it wasn't a legitimate temptation, it wouldn't be in here. He was tempted to do this. So we better take this seriously and see what was going on here. He said, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you. And in their hands, they'll bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Well, he quoted it right So what's the problem? Jesus responded by saying what? Hmm? It is written again. It's also written. You shall what? You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So apparently if he had done this, he would have been tempting God. tempting God and he refused to do it for one thing you don't want to be following the devil's directions no matter how many scriptures he quotes but what is the temptation I know as a teenager I first began to find out Uh, some things about the word and faith and God began to be real to me and I actually told a family member this I think I was I must have been 14 or 15 maybe something like that I said now I just believe if a person had faith that even if you're out in the middle of the street and you stand in front of a truck coming at you and uh, if you had faith God would protect you, it couldn't hurt you. Does that sound similar to this? Now see, I'm thinking it shows faith. If a man really had faith, if a woman really had faith, you could prove it. You could demonstrate it. Basically, 
What you're saying in that case, I mean, here comes a Mack truck coming straight at you. And if you really had faith, you'd do nothing. You'd just stand there and trust God to protect you. And now we're going to find out, do you really believe this or not? You hear the angle? Why would this have been a temptation to Jesus? He believes this. He believes he has angels. He believes that they are well able and they will swoop him up and pick him up lest he hurt even his toe. He believes this. He does have faith. And the temptation is prove it. If you really believe it, prove it. Did you hear that phrase? If you really believe it, prove it. This is the devil talking. This is the devil talking. It's not God. What did Jesus say? Did he try to convince the devil he did believe it? That he did have faith? That this was not just imaginary, that the angels were real and they would pick you up. They would catch you. Did he try to convince him of any of that? Or that he did really have faith? He wasn't afraid to jump off the pinnacle. No. Listen, my friend, you got nothing to prove to the devil. Amen. Nothing. Amen. He's not your Lord. Amen. Has no part nor lot in your life. Hmm? And you are not called to prove the word to other people. And to prove that you have faith to other people. Why would you be? Where did it say? In the scripture, prove to other people that you have faith. Let's say you did. Let's say you accomplished it. You proved to everybody, all your unbelieving kinfolks and your unbelieving neighbors, you proved to them that you have faith. Now what are they convinced of? That you have faith, and they're impressed with your faith, you. 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 Is that God's main objective? Is to get glory to you? And to have people walking around town going, I'm telling you what, that Moe's got faith. I saw him. I'm telling you what, he's got faith. She's got faith. They've got faith. I'm telling you. They got, what does that accomplish? Does it really glorify God that people are impressed with you and your faith? Now, there's some subtle stuff going on here or else Jesus wouldn't have been tempted. Wouldn't even have been a temptation to him. But it was. Every one of these was a temptation to him. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to yield to the temptation, to give in to it. He was tempted in all points, just like us, the Bible said. In every point and way that a man, a human being has ever been tempted, Jesus was tempted. In every, anything you've ever been tempted to do, he was tempted to do. I know that sounds hard to believe, but the Bible says it. The difference is, he never yielded to it, proving you and I don't have to, because he did it as a man. He didn't do it as God, he did it as a man, with no unfair advantage over you or I, proving you don't have to yield. But on this occasion, he was pulled, he was tempted to do this. But by, but by revelation, he said, no, 
It's also written. It's written again. You don't tempt God. You don't tempt God. Say that out loud. You don't tempt God. You don't tempt God. Uh, turn with me to Proverbs uh, 27. I believe this is really important. I've seen a lot of folks make a lot of mistakes in these areas. It, it's, it can be a combination of pride and ignorance. You, you've heard stories of people that did foolish things in the name of faith, haven't you? So and so throwed away their uh, medication and died. So and so throwed away their reading glasses and, and drove and had a wreck and got killed. These kind of things have happened. So and so did this, and so and so did what? Pro trying to prove they believe this. Trying to prove to God that God knows what you believe. He, he knows your thoughts are far off and every word before you say it. He knows whether you believe or you don't. And people get caught up in trying to prove that I believe this word and prove to somebody else. It's error. It's wrong. Let me, let me tell you this story of my father in the faith, Brother Hagen, told about some men he knew of. This was back, oh, this would have been in the 30s, I guess. A couple of guys had gone into this neighboring city and place and bought a bunch of handles, hoe handles, axe handles, wooden handles. And they had been cut, and they were green, and they were nice, and they're in the wagon. They had a wagon and some horses or mules, whatever it was, and they got them a whole load of these handles, and they're going to bring them back and sell them and make a profit. It's their business. Well, they, they traveled all day and got in late at night, and they laid down. And in the middle of the night, or there's already late when they went to bed, but I guess it's early morning or whatever, they woke up and it's thundering and it's raining. And one of the guys said to the other one, he said, man, it's raining, it's raining. The guy said, yeah, he said, it's raining on our handles. He said, oh yeah. He said, uh, he said they'll get wet and when the sun comes out in the morning, shines on it can warp them. And the guy said, well, let's just believe God that they don't warp. So they prayed, real short prayer because they were real sleepy. <laughs> Been traveling all day, you know. Oh, God, protect our handles. Don't let them warp. And so they went off to sleep. And it rained and rained and rained. And then the sun came out that morning. Well, they got in so late, they slept late. And they got up and went out to their wagon. And all of them were warped. Their hoe handles, their axe handles, their shovel handles, they're all warped. And they're upset. One guy said, I don't understand it. We prayed. We asked the Lord to, to keep these from warping. And why didn't he do it? Wrong question. I said wrong question. Even in their fatigued state, the Lord woke them up. They realized it's raining. He brought it to their awareness that the sun could come out on those wet handles and dry them and warp them. Hmm? Right. Made them aware of it. Yes. 
they got opportunity to do something about it. But no, they're going to pray and believe God. Now, this kind of thing has happened with so-called faith people again and again and again. And people are like confused, like, I don't understand why didn't God do this or why didn't he keep this from happening? It's tempting God. It's pride. It's ignorance. People try to make everything spectacular. And instead of following the Lord's warnings and leadings and guidings, they try to make him adapt to the way they want it to happen spectacularly. Uh And it's rebellion and disobedience and pride and probably a good dose of ignorance. But you wind up, their, their goods, which is probably all the money they had right then, lost. Their goods not protected. Hmm? Their business not protected. Why? I don't care if you, if you carry a bronze plated copy of the 91st Psalm in your front pocket on your overalls. If you got Psalm 91 engraved on your horse's bridle, (laughs) the Lord wakes you up, causes you to be aware of the situation. He is protecting you. That's what's going on right now. Time for you to get your drag yourself up and go get wet. Hmm? That ain't what your flesh wants to do. You want something to be spectacular. But that's how you get out from under the protection. Remember, he that dwells, dwells, dwells in the secret place of the Most High. That's the one who lives, abides under this canopy of protection. And he that keeps his commandments dwells in him. So when he says, it's raining, boy, get up and get out there and get those things in the barn and get them protected. He is protecting you. That is his protection. Can you see this? Thank you, Lord. Uh, Go to the book of Acts, please. I, I know uh, you, get, you got that place in Proverbs, but for right now, go to the book of Acts. For time's sake, I'll just read this to you. How did the Father protect Jesus as a child? How did he protect him? Couldn't he have done it in a more spectacular fashion? He could have. But again and again, he warned them of what was going on. He let them know what Herod had on his mind, what he was planning to do. And when you know that, then you know enough to get moving. Right? People make things too complicated, and the devil is in it, trying to complicate it. Jump off the pinnacle. The first thing that should cross your mind is, why? (laughs) Why should I jump off the pinnacle? Because it is written. He'll give his angel. Yeah, okay, but why do I need to jump? Why do I need to put myself in a position where they have to swoop down and get me to keep me from being hurt when I know enough to not jump off the pinnacle? But see, people get spiritual. Huh? And and, and watch it, watch it. This always goes hand in hand with you having power other people don't have, with you doing things other people haven't demonstrated, with you showing people things others hadn't been able to show them. Spiritual pride. 
It's ugly. And it's got nothing to do with glorifying God. People try to make it, oh, we're going to glorify God. I, but it, it comes right back here. I've got to. See, the, 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 the occult, spiritualism, the reason it draws the people that it draws is because it has the promise of you getting power. You getting power. It's a lie. I said, it's a lie. The only power you're going to tap into is death. But that's the promise. People imagine, man, I'll get so much power, I'll be able to levitate. Uh, and, and what will that do? Let's say you levitated for 30 days. What did you accomplish? What did that do? Didn't feed anybody, didn't heal anybody, didn't get anybody any answers, but it would prove I, it would prove I had power. Oh. <laughs> and people get into this as Christians. They're going to have all this power. We're going to be able to do this, prove this, and show this, and shake this. Well, if you did it, who would get the glory? Ask and look. People are like, well, it's for God. It's for God. Yeah, right. Ask him how he wants it done. And so many times, you're going to find out it's a lot more normal seeming <laughs> than you would like. Are y'all with me or not? But it's his choice. That's the way he wants it done. That's the way he has chosen. So what did Jesus do then? I guess he climbed down. I guess he got down the ordinary way. That's not very spectacular. No flying. No grand arrival. Huh? No angelic manifestation in wings. That's just you grunting and holding on and, and, and climbing down. And people going, what were you doing up there? Ah, that's a long story. How many understand Jesus did a lot of normal stuff? He walked where he went, or rode a donkey, or in a boat. He ate and slept and got dressed and hmm. Now there were some outstanding things happened, but this is these things didn't happen all day every day. Are you an ax? Yes. Ax, the, uh, well, go to Acts 9, but then go to Matthew 12 also. I wanna, we'll go Matthew, then Acts 9. Matthew 12, then Acts 9. Matthew 12, are you there? Yes. I hear pages turning. Matthew 12, 12 and 14. 12 and 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, against Jesus, how they might destroy him. And when Jesus knew it, everybody say, when he knew it. When he knew it. What did he do? He withdrew himself from there. He left. When he knew it, he left. You see that repeatedly. When he knew they were trying to kill him, he left. <laughs> Said out loud, when he knew it, he left. Now go to Acts 14 and 5. 
Acts 14, 5. When there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and they did what? Fled, fled is a pretty strong word. What does fled mean? Fled means you got out of there. Right? You did not waste a lot of time packing your bags or messing around. You got out of there. Now, do you see the great apostle? Hmm? In a hurry to get out of town. Where's his faith? Why don't he just stand there and prove to him? He's a man of God, and they can't hurt him. Hmm? Why didn't Jesus do it? Well, uh, let me give you some more while we're on this. Go to another one. Uh, when they were, the, the thing I want you to say, verse 6, when they were aware of it. Did you hear that? Uh, we just got, re- got through reading in Matthew 12, 15. When he knew it, when Jesus knew it. Somebody say, when he knew it. When he knew it, when, he knew it, when they were aware of it. Couldn't, let's say those guys with the warped hoe handles. They could have just slept through it. Or even if they woke up half, you know, uh, awake, it could have not occurred to them that the sun might come out before they got up. God making you aware of this is his protection. Don't try to over-spectacularize it. Don't try to prove a bunch of stuff to people. It can be spiritual pride. Can you see this? Can you get the enemies tempting Jesus? Jump off of here. Why? To prove what? To who? He said, no, that'd be tempting God. It's written you don't tempt God. And so I'm not doing it. And he didn't. And he's our example. If he didn't jump and prove something, I ain't jumping. The truck's coming. You're aware that the truck is coming. You're aware of what a 70 mile per hour Mack with a 40 foot trailer behind it can do to your little frame. You're aware of it. You see it. You know it. To stand there and say, I believe God is ignorant and prideful and tempting God. Right? You know to get out of the way. (laughs) Now, why why I say this? Because I think a lot of you know why we say this. People are missing it in these areas, aren't they? You know, if you are made aware of something, let's say you were going through this certain path, and somebody points out to you, no, there's a big rattlesnake in that bush right there that you're about to walk through. Now, you don't need a special word from the Lord. (laughs) Don't go through the bush. Well, I'm going to stop and check my heart. Y'all, let's just pray in the Spirit a little bit here (laughs) to see whether we should keep... Are you dumb? People do this all the time though, right? Somebody makes you aware. Well, they said they, they said they put a bomb on that plane. This is one you're supposed to fly on in two hours. We don't know if it's right or not. They said there's one on there. You don't need a special word from the Lord, don't get on the plane. You need a special word from the Lord if you get on the plane. (laughs) 
Are you with me? I don't know if you understood what I meant by that. They say, well, it hasn't been substantiated. But they say there may be a, a ball in the cargo. But they don't think there's anything to it. They think they're just going to go flying. Now, you need a word from the Lord to get on the plane. Because right. yeah. yeah. you could have very easily just boarded and nobody knew. Right. Now you are aware of something. Yeah. Why were you made aware of it? Yeah. Why did you find out about it? You could have very easily just not known. Yeah. Now you know something. Yes. And God gave you a brain. Yes. <laughs> and understanding. Right? Don't you get on this kick. Well, yeah, but I got people with me and I don't want them to think I don't have any faith. So we're just going to believe God now. Y'all, come on. I know they said it, but we're not scared. Come on. We're not scared. No, but you're dumb. I have faith. I'm not afraid of these things. Yeah, but you're ignorant. Paul had faith. Paul knew God. He's been caught up to the third heaven. He's seen Jesus. And when he finds out they're trying to kill him, he leaves town immediately. Fled. That means they peeled out of the driveway. Go get the car now. <laughs> Yeah, but what about your stuff at the hotel? We'll buy some new stuff at the Walmart. Next meeting, just get out of here. Get out of here. There's people trying to kill us. If you know people are trying to kill you, then you should know what to do. The only way you should do anything else is if the Lord specifically told you, stay. Now, if he told you to stay, you're going to be okay. But you don't have to hear some special word. You know. You've been made aware of something. Is this okay? Can y'all can y'all see this? Thank you, Lord. Acts 22. This is even stronger here. <laughs> Acts 22. People get confused, don't they? They confuse their self. They make it more complicated than it has to be. A few years ago, was the first year we were here or right after that? Man, it was time for everybody to go on vacation and uh, there was this storm came through, roads iced up. Do you remember 65 was iced up and 40 and people spent the night on the interstate. Listen, if you hear there's going to be weather like that, you don't have to pray to hear from God about what to do. He's made you aware. You could have been halfway there before anybody found out about it. He's made you aware of it. Now you, would, you should need a strong word from the Lord to go. We were up in uh, New York, Phyllis and myself and, and brother uh, uh, Jesse, Kathy Duplantis, in his aircraft. And we're going up there and doing something. We're coming back. We all planned to come back. All of us had stuff to do. We get up there. He's got a good aircraft. He's got, you know, Best equipment, it's, it's uh, certified to fly in all kind of conditions, including icing conditions. We're up there in the wintertime, and we get ready to go. I mean, we're, everything's ready. Money's been spent. Everything's ready. And they say the forecast is freezing rain. Well, we didn't need a special word from the Lord. What do we do? 
Go back to the hotel. Didn't need an angelic voice. Didn't need a vision. Didn't have to pray in the spirit for 30 minutes or an hour. Why? God, we could have just as easily taken off and nobody knew about it. Right? God let us know beforehand when they were aware of it. Did you get Jesus himself, when he was aware of it, when he knew it, action. People make this stuff too complicated. And people get themselves in trouble trying to be so what they call spiritual. And it's actually spiritual pride. Don't make it hard. The roads are icy. Everybody's sliding off in the ditch. Can you figure that out or not? Huh? What do you do? Stay at the house. I'm going to have to pray about it. Why? What do you got to pray about? Now, if there was some big reason why the Lord wanted you to go, he would tell you. And you'd know it. Hmm? You'd know it. And short of that, you know what to do. Stay home. Make some nachos. (laughs) Have fun. Huh? Yeah, but we had all these plans. So do you know how to be led or not? Yeah, but we've already spent all this money. Well, are you led by money or by the Lord? Yeah, my family is upset and they're going to, are you led by your family? You're led by the Lord. It's the only days I have off. Well, you can, you can reason out a thousand different ways to get out and, and get yourself killed. Or you can have some sense. Huh? Not make it complicated. Hmm? To be led by the Spirit, you've got to be flexible. You can't be locked into everything. Well, we've made our plans and we've spent our money. And we've done well. That's a way to miss God. You've got to be. Yeah, you made your plans, but you got to be open. You've got to be open for the Lord to make you aware of something to change your plans. Acts twenty-two. Are you there? Acts twenty-two seventeen. Twenty-two seventeen. Uh, Paul, after his experience with Jesus uh, on the, the road to Damascus, had another experience. Verse 17, it came to pass when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him, saw the Lord. And the Lord said to me, Huh? The Lord said to me. Now, man, he, here he is having a spectacular experience. He's having a spectacular experience. And what is the message? <laughs> Hurry up and get out of town. <laughs> Hurry up. I mean, hurry and get out of town, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. He said, Lord, they know that I did this and that, but the message was the same. Hurry up and get out. Would the Lord ever tell you, hurry up and get out of here? Because they're trying to hurt you. No, no, God would just protect me. He'd just protect me. Right, that's what he's doing. By telling you to hurry up and get out of town. (laughs) now we're talking about a man whose ministry is a a a bedrock part of the christian church if he's going to do something spectacular he would have been a great time but how does he protect this man and this ministry that is affecting you and i tonight and every church around the world he tells him, hurry up. Somebody say, hurry up. hurry up. Hurry up and get out of town. Hurry up. Get out of here. 
This is the protection of the Lord. It'd be foolish and prideful for me and you to assume that he's going to do something different and more spectacular for us than for Jesus or for Paul. Who would we think we are? Go to Proverbs 21. How many young people are not with us anymore because they were double dog dared? People stood up by the side and, and said, cluck, 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 cluck. Chicken, 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 you're scared. Yeller, yeller, you're yeller. Do it. I ain't afraid. We'll do it. I'm not afraid. We'll do it. Prove it. Do it. Jump. And young, dumb people, and sometimes older, dumb people. Have you ever heard people? I've heard adults, grown men say, now don't dare me. Don't dare me. (laughs) Bye, grabbies, don't dare me. What does that mean? Well, it means you're stupid. Yeah. What do you think they're going to do? Dare you. Don't dare me. Because why? Because you'll do it to prove what? I ain't scared. That's probably a lie. They're probably scared spitless. That's why they're trying so hard to convince somebody else that they're not scared because they're completely terrified. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, I know, I know it's humorous, but you know, I'm, I'm sure you know people you went to school with yes, that are not here. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes, sir. Other people you know, oh, they did it and they're dead. They did it. They're going to prove it. Prove what? To who? So ignorant. I'm believing none of our youth are that ignorant. Amen. And I'm believing our adults are not that ignorant. Amen. It is wonderful to be secure. Yes. <laughs> I, I, you've heard me say this perhaps, but I, it stuck in me years ago, decades ago. I heard a fellow preaching, and he's giving a testimony. He said these guys took him up in the skyscraper. I forget how tall it was, but it was huge. And he went on this little bitty balcony, little bitty thing, just enough room enough for him, and he's holding on to the rail, and he said, man, the cars look like they're this big, and the people, and he's looking, and his thought comes to him, why don't you just jump? Why don't you just jump? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. And he says, you jump. <laughs> I'm not. And when he said that, I thought, excellent. That is excellent. Because he knows where it's coming from. And he's not so insecure and confused that he thinks he needs to prove anything or reason anything. He said, you do it. I'm not stupid. The thoughts of temptation, thoughts of stupidity like this can come to any of us. I've had thoughts come to my mind about doing some kind of sin or something. And I do the same thing. You know, the thought comes, why don't you do that? And I think, I'm not stupid. I'm not, no, I'm not doing it. No. And you don't just grip the handle and go, what's wrong with me? God, are you testing me? Oh, the Lord is testing. And the devil will go, it's exactly the Lord is testing you. Do you believe it or do you not? Now it's time to prove Do you love God with all your heart? (laughs) Do you trust God with all? Yeah, I trust God. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. That's the devil. I said, that's the devil talking to you. God already knows what you believe and what you don't. How you love and how you don't. Already knows.
Where are you? Man, man, man. Here's another sermon. <laughs> Proverbs 21, I, I, I don't think this will take long, but I want you to see it. This is important. Proverbs 31. Have you known of anybody made mistakes in these areas? Huh? Both. Chapter 21, verse 31. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> I was talking to Brother Jesse a while back, you know, how he carries on. He said, Keith, I hurt the devil tonight. I hurt him bad. I hurt him bad. It's take him a while to get over this. I feel like that tonight. We, we have, we have yeah. taken some things away from the enemy and some people that otherwise would have been confused or duped or won't be. Won't be. They'll go, hey, I know all I need to know. I'm, I'm out of here. I'm not doing that. You know, I know. And don't feel I got to prove this or I got to maintain my faith image in front of the other people. They're watching me to see what I'm going to. You shouldn't be thinking that way anyway. You just want to do what the Lord chose you to do. Amen. When he makes you aware of something, thank him. Act accordingly. Yes. Don't make it too hard. Don't complicate it. Think about how Jesus operated, how Paul operated. Don't try to be more spectacular than them. Yes. Proverb 21, 31. Now, this is another side of this. Proverbs 21, 31. Are you there? Yes. What does it say? The horse, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Another translation says, you can get the horses ready for battle, but it is the Lord who gives the victory. But now here's my question. Do you still get the horses ready? Yeah. Yes, you get the horses ready. Even though you know it's the Lord who, who gives you the victory. It's the Lord who's going to keep me safe. Do I still get my stuff ready? Yes. So this is another area where people have been presumptuous. we got people in our nation that challenge us as Christians. If you really believed that God would protect you, then quit spending all these billions on defense. Hmm? And just prove what you believe. Well, we're not that ignorant. The Bible said, get the horse ready. <laughs> Load the tank. Hmm? Develop the jet. Develop the, 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 the defense. Why? Because there's devilish people in the world. Now, you get all your stuff done. You do the best you know how to do. Now what? Now... We don't count on our stuff saving us. We're ready. We use it. But we don't count on that to save us. We're counting on the Lord. Some trust in chariots. Some in horses. But we will remember, we'll rely, we'll trust in the name of the Lord our God. Hmm? Listen to this, 2 Chronicles 20. You don't have to turn there, but 2 Chronicles 20. Put it up on the screen if you can. 2 Chronicles 20, 17. He told them, he said, you will not need to fight in this battle. What does that sound like then? Huh? You will not need to fight in this battle. A lot of folk could take that word and go, well, hey. Relax, no need spending any money, no need getting anything ready. We don't, we're not going to need to fight. Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, there it is again, don't be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out of, huh? Well, I thought we weren't going to have to fight on this one. But you still got to go out. 
I said, you still got to go out. Even when the Lord says, I got this. I'm going to do this thing. You still have to load up and get the horses ready. Hmm? And go. But you're not counting on your stuff. You're not counting on your arm. You're not counting on your expertise. And when you get the victory, you don't give the glory to yourself. You give it to him. Do you see this? Oh, this is so important. Prepare the horses. God gave them manna to eat. Spectacular. Out of the sky it fell. On a daily basis, they still had to go out and pick it up. Right? God saved Noah and all his family and all the animals from the flood that nobody had never heard of anything like this, but he still had to build the boat. Didn't he? Yeah. See, we got people that try to tell us if you just have enough faith, you don't do anything. If you have enough faith, you can quit your job and lay on the couch. Hmm? If you have enough faith, you can do nothing. And we're going to prove to you how much faith we have by doing nothing. James said, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> James said, show me your faith without your works. You can't do it. I'll show you my faith by my getting ready, by my building this boat by my getting these horses ready, yes, by us training and preparing, yes. by us working. Yes, Come on now, are you listening? Yes. Oh, can you see this? Yes. David said to the Philistine Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel. But he still took his sling. <laughs> Didn't he? He took his sling. And that's what God used. Go to two verses. Go to Matthew 24 first and then Luke 22. Can, can you get the spirit of this? That there are so many people that they call stuff being spiritual and they make big ado out of it and they try to make other people feel that they're so carnal and because, you know, you look at it and you go, well, duh, there's a snake in the bush. We should just go around. <laughs> oh, you're carnal and you didn't pray this morning. I see the snake. I'm going around. We're going to fast and pray and see what the Lord tells us about the snake. <laughs> but people do this kind of stuff all, and they call their stuff being more spiritual, and it is so prideful. It is so ugly. It's all about them showing something to somebody else and proving how much faith they have and how spiritual they are. If you know there's a snake in the bush, you should need a strong, special word yeah. <laughs> to do anything except go around. Uh -huh. right. You don't have to have any word about going around. Right. You know, snake in the bush. <laughs> go around. <laughs> They're trying to kill me. Hurry up, get out of town. Yeah. Unless the Lord said something strong to you, otherwise you know what to do. He is protecting you by making you aware of it and giving you time and opportunity to do something about it. Here's something that can answer some questions. Some people think it's controversial, to, con controversial but to me it's very obvious and plain. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And 43. Verse 
24, 43. Jesus is talking. He said, know this, if the goodman, or we might just say the man of the house, had known in what watch or what time the thief would come, he would have what? He would have stayed in his bed and believed God. Hmm? Just believed God that he wouldn't do it. He would have watched. So he'd have stayed awake and watched. And would not have suffered or would not have allowed or permitted his house to be broken up or broken into. Now, how's he going to do that? <laughs> how's he going to keep him from breaking in? People have questions about, you know, could you use force? Could you do this? Go to Luke, where the other place you have over there. He said he wouldn't let him do it. He's going to have to do something. If he, he says, I'm not going to let you come in here. Here's a guy trying to break in. The Lord let you know about it. Hmm? And so you watched and you caught the guy trying to break in. And you say, you are not coming in here. How are you going to keep him from it? <laughs> well, Luke 24, one way would be a weapon. People try, what did I say? Luke 22, yeah. Luke 22 and 35. People say, oh, no, no, if you had faith now, if you had faith, no, no, you wouldn't have to do it. And that's some of the people say, if we had enough faith, we wouldn't even have a military. And yet the Bible said, get the horses ready. But don't trust in the horses. Do everything you know to get ready, but then when it's all done, we're trusting God to make this thing happen. Our faith is in Him. But that don't mean we don't load the guns. <laughs> Luke 22. Some folks are going to have to think about this. I can tell that right now. Verse 35 was Luke twenty two thirty five. 35. Jesus said, when I sent you out without a purse and without scrip and shoes, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. In other words, he, he did that to demonstrate something to them. They had never lived by faith at all. They didn't know he's showing them what he could do and how God could provide for them. Did you know that manna sustained the, the Israelites in the wilderness for years, but as soon as they got into the promised land where they had crops, it stopped? The manna stopped. Why? Because now you got crops. You can get it the regular way. And it's much better. But he demonstrated that to them, the miraculous and the provision, and, and they've seen this. Verse 36, but he tells them something different now. But now he that has a purse, what? Let him take it. And if you got script, take that. And if you don't have a sword, huh? What? <laughs> what? Who said this? Is this Jesus? Are you sure? Yes. The, a sword, a personal sword, was the equivalent of a handgun. It was the best personal weapon you could carry. And it was a concealed weapon. Wasn't it? And he said, if you don't have one, sell something and get one. What do these folks do with these verses? And uh, what'd they say? <laughs> Peter said, Jesus, I got mine. <laughs> uh, I'm packing. I, I, got, I got mine. I, I'm strapped, yeah. 
<laughs> and one of the other guys said, yeah, I got mine too. I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I, always, I don't leave home without it. <laughs> These are Jesus 12. Is that right? These are Jesus 12. Yes, 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 yes. And what did he say? What did Jesus say? Oh, boys, I was kidding. No, just joking. No, but leave them things. Uh, leave them things. Don't, don't be carrying them things around me because I don't like weapons. I'm Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's a dove. And, and weapons bother him. <laughs> and we have faith in God to protect us so we don't need such things. This is what people believe. It's not what Jesus said. It's not what he did. It's not what his disciples did. He said, if you don't have a weapon, sell something and get one. Jesus. No folk don't like that. That's what he said. And they spoke up and said, we got two right now. He said, that's, that's enough for now. And I, I, you know, Jesus never intended for them to, have to fight and defend him and protect him. But I do believe that they had the opportunity to demonstrate how far they were willing to go. Hmm? And I believe Peter and whoever else responded that way will get cl credit for it and reward for it in the world to come because I, th I think that's one reason that Peter got so confused after this because when he said, he said, I am, you know, Jesus said, before the cock crows, uh, you'll deny me. And he said, no way, no way. I will die with you. And I believe he meant it to the core of his being. He got his weapon on him. <laughs> right? He come to the party to dance. Didn't he? He's, and when they, when they whipped out their, their blades, he didn't bat an eye. He whipped it out. And he's a fisherman. He's not a soldier. But he waded into them. Figuring he's about to die. But he's going to take out an ear or two. <laughs> for. <laughs> Maybe a nose and a finger on me. Watch out. Why? Because you're messing with my Jesus. And I am not going to stand here while you take him down. Hmm? And it was honorable. Jesus is the one who asked them, did they have any weapons? Didn't he? If he hadn't wanted any of this, he would have told them, have you got any weapons? Leave them here. Don't take them in. No they should have had the opportunity to demonstrate what they would do. And he's not going to let them fight and defend them. He's already, he's on the course to the cross. And that's why he said, no, that's enough. That's enough. What does that mean? You've proven what you would do. You've shown what you'd do. But you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Put them up. This cup my father's given me, I got to drink it. I got to do it. You know, he said that later on. He said, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would fight for me. You saw an inkling of that already back there. And I believe that pleased the Lord. Well, you know it would. To see that people that love you, they're ready to stand up. If the man, the good man of the house, had known when the thief was going to break through, he would have watched. He wouldn't have let him come through. How is he going to keep him out? He's got to do what he knows to do. Right? right? That's right. True. People complicate things. They try to, you know, whatever. But <laughs> the Bible is plain. It's not as complicated as people make it out to be. And thank God we have a protector. Thank God we have angels. But God also told us what to do, and we do get the horses ready. I said, we get the horses ready, and we buy the sword, and we sharpen it, and we load the weapons. We train our military, right? We make the fighters, we make the bombers, we make the stuff. And people say, well, I don't make sense to me. You say, God's a God of love. How can he be? Read the Bible. Just, just read the Bible and accept it. Whether you understand it or not, 
Hmm? Yes, sir. And trust him. Do everything you know how to do and then say, Lord, we got it. I got, I got my Uzi. I got my nine mil with 12 clips. I got my three dogs. I got, <laughs> but Lord, my faith's not in this stuff. My faith is in you, right? We got the Marines. We got the Air Force. We got the Army. We got the Navy. We, 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 got, we got our stuff. Thank God for them. And they're tough and they're mean. They're able and they're strong. But our faith is in our God because unless the Lord keeps the house in the city, the watchman gets up in vain. And they load their weapons in vain unless he's in it. But thank God he's in it. Stand on your feet.